Hey, some girls. Good morning. Sup. Richard, you're going to get hot in that coat. Sup. Richard's here. I don't know. Richard is here. How did you get lost coming here? I don't know. I took, the, I took, I went down to the next street over. And I said, well, I just cut hey. through. Richard, up on the end Richard. Before into magnesia. Welcome to the golden year. <laughs> the memory is the second thing to go. Good morning, Richard. Good morning. <laughs> Are we ready to sing? I, I have picked one this morning that I think is apropos for the uh, the moment in our history. Number 143, Rescue the Perishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do one, two, and four. Rescue the Perishing. I'll try to pitch it to where we don't have to stand on our tiptoes for, yeah. the, for the high notes. All right. Okay. What page? Richard, here's a chair. You need some help there, Bill. 144, I think you said. 143. 143, okay. <laughs> One, three, and four. You got your hearing aids on, Mama? No. <laughs> One, two, and four. One, two, and four verses. That's <laughs> the worst thing enough, that's right. Oh, well, you can we ready? Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are flying him, still he is waiting, waiting again as the child to receive. Plead with him earnestly, plead with him gently. He will forgive if they only believe. tell a little story about this. That word down on the bottom, merciful. We had a choir director when we lived in, in Tennessee <laughs> that forbade us to say mercy. It was mussy. But it comes out that way when you're singing. And every time I see that word, I think of Vince Edwards. <laughs> he's, now, he's now the chief organist and his organ is ten, ten times bigger than ours. Wow. In an Episcopal church yeah, in New York in City. Rhode oh, in Rhode Island. I'm Ooh, sorry. Wow. Ooh. It used to be in New York. But it used to be in New York, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, Our music department is traveling. <laughs> so, um, but Andy will be back next week, and Ian was tied up today, so here we are. Um, oh. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining the Asbury Sunday School class. I can't say it's a gorgeous day, but it's on the positive side, it's not raining. But I think all of this is the Sahara dust. Anyway, we're here. Um, I don't know, but the, June has been the absolute longest month. <laughs> I don't think June is ever going to end. I had to replace my air conditioner last week. Oh no! My big sycamore tree got hit by a straight line wind, and it blew the top right off of it onto my boathouse. Oh. So. 
it's been kind of a weird week. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. This morning we have Bill doing our devotion and we have Richard um, from the Heritage class, right? I think so. Oh, you think so? Okay. <laughs> Richard is going to do our lesson today. Thank you all for coming and thank you all for tuning in to us. <laughs> Uh, this is from 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by Him. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. During the past school year, a colleague, a colleague and friend approached me and such suggested I start a Bible class for teachers. After some thought and prayer, I decided to send an email to teachers and other staff inviting them to my classroom for Bible study before the school day on Tuesdays and on Fridays. I had no idea what to expect, but on Tuesdays we studied the book of James and on Fridays the book of Philippians. In Proverbs, we are told that as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It took a couple of meetings for trust to build, but we discovered that as we studied together, we grew as friends. We came, became more willing to share our struggles with one another. We listened to one another. We prayed with one another. We encouraged one another, even checking on those who missed the meeting. God truly worked in our midst, encouraging us through scripture and through fellowship. Most of all, God helped each of us learn to rely more upon the working of the Holy Spirit in all our relationships with one another, our students, and with God, as we do in this class here. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for the Bible. Help us to grow as we read it, and lead us to find others who will faithfully study with us. Amen. Amen. And now my baby twin brother, Richard Langston, <laughs> is going to teach the lesson. That's an evil one. I'm the good one. <laughs> He's the baby. I'm the good looking one, too. <laughs> he also has the most hair. <laughs> you Thank you, Richard. I almost didn't get here. I got I turned one or two streets before off from Hendrix. And I ended up over in, I don't know where, I-95 or something, I don't know. And I don't suppose it much matters. Uh, relative to my dress, I am a son of the South. Microphone. Although, I, although I'm adopted, I was raised by a mother from Richmond, Virginia, and a father from Leesville, South Carolina. And I was taught that when you go downtown to go to church, you put on a coat and tie. Well, we're not quite in church, so I'm splitting the difference. I got on a coat with no tie. Uh, you should have worn the tie instead of the coat. We, uh, we're going to talk about wisdom today. And that's... Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, wisdom is probably, in my mind, the most important thing that we seek the truth and, and, but it takes wisdom to, to understand the truth and the best I can figure out wisdom is having faith and understanding why and it's having the ability to make sensible decisions wisdom is getting knowledge and knowing what to do with it there's a lot of people with a lot of knowledge, and they'll tell you about it, um, ad infinitum, and a lot of people don't have any knowledge, but they'll tell you about that too. Uh, I do that sometimes myself, but uh, that's okay. I have uh, 
access those of you who don't know me i uh, was educated at the cultural center of the universe in athens georgia <laughs> so i've always been impressed with southern philosophers and i'm not going to ramble on but i'm going to tell you about two of my favorites the first one is a guy named charlie mcclendon who was the football coach at LSU in the early 1950s to the 60s. And Charlie was a good old country boy, and they had a pretty good team, and not like they did last year, but they were, they were pretty good. And um, Charlie was asked what he, how he evaluated the talent level of his football players, and his quote was, when he saw a good one, he says, quote, that dog will hunt. And meaning that the player was pretty good. Because a, good, a, a dog that'll hunt's a pretty good dog. The other one is a young woman named Casey Musgraves, who's an entertainer. Uh, she lives in Nashville. She's a singer-songwriter and is about the fifth richest person in Nashville, which is ain't a lot. She's a very attractive, good-looking young woman who has a wonderful voice, but she can write songs with lyrics that sometimes shock older people, but she's very popular. She's won about five or six Grammys. She's caused other people who've sung her songs or sang her songs to earn Grammys. And uh, one of the, the lyrics that she wrote was, it is what it is till it ain't anymore. <laughs> and that, that's, that's pretty true. <laughs> that's wisdom. Yeah. Now, I, don't know, I, I don't know where it came from, but I, I'll throw in one more, and that's Clyde Lipscomb. He used to be the, the, the preacher down at HAB. Clyde said, and he was he when he retired, he came back about 10 years later, was in my Sunday school class, and he always said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> and uh, true words were never spoken. But I've always kind of thought of, of, of Solomon as being the smartest guy in the Bible. Here he, he's about to take over the kingdom. And the Lord appears to him and says, What do you want, Solomon? And what do you think he asked for? Wisdom. Wisdom. Because if you got wisdom, you can figure most of it out and you don't get taken in by many folks. So I would, I, whenever I read the Bible, and I read it every day, before I do that, <coughs> knowing that while I have a good education, I'm not that wise, so I pray to the Lord to come into my brain, to my soul, and help me to understand what I'm reading and give me the wisdom to understand it and the courage and strength to do it. So, um, with that said, um, we'll get into this wisdom thing. Uh, scripture indicates that uh, wisdom manifests itself in many ways, sometimes foolishly, sometimes unfoolishly, in, in the... In the, in the Guide here, we're talking about wisdom as two women. I find it wise enough to understand that. <laughs> the women, are, women got the wisdom, and I got the, the I got the strong bank and, and the weak mind, and they, they got the brains. Well, it's rooted in one source, and that's God. We remember from Proverbs that fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. So, if you want to know what's going on, read the Bible. It'll tell you what you need to know. <laughs> there's a, uh, there's a, an old song that the Flatten Scrubs used to sing called You Can Feel It In Your Soul. And uh, the words are pretty apropos for that when they said if you go to church on Sunday and you feel like you're alone, don't just stand there 
sing and shout. At any rate, we've come to the point now where we're looking at Proverbs is saying that wisdom is a woman. Now this is a letter, a letter, whatever. Um, as a boy, when Jesus was preaching, he had the wisdom, and he just flabbergasted everybody that came to hear him teach in the synagogue. I mean, they had gone away. How could a young boy like that know as much as he did? Like I was watching YouTube the other day, and Paul Simon was doing some deal with, and Beck Medler came out there, and he wrote this sensational song when he was 26 years old. Bette Miller said, well, who knew at 26 what you knew? And uh, she was right. He was a, a more prolific than I know. I can't, my, my youngest son has put me on the YouTube, and I, I'm, I, I grew up listening to hillbilly music in the 50s and 60s, and I still do. <laughs> Flatten Scruggs, and there's a new group out called the Earls of Leicester, which is flat, they're doing flat and scrub stuff. And I can listen to that. I listen to YouTube for two or three hours a day. That shows you my intellectual level. <laughs> the guy that sings with them sang some song, and when he ended up, they had he got a well, almost a standing ovation, and he said, "Thank you, music lovers." <laughs> well, at any rate, um, a first a person's faith is marked by uh, uh, obedience to God's worth and is evidenced by transformed life. If you're doing what God tells you to do, then people are going to know that you changed your life, that you're on the right path. I'm, I'm not, I don't know how I ever got into teaching. God has a sense of humor. But I've always said that my evangelism is what I call lifestyle evangelism. Because when I retired, I'd been for 35 years making other people rich by manipulating them into doing what I got them to do. And they did. They made a lot of money. And I did too. And I wasn't a stockbroker. Uh, but at any rate, when I retired, I, um, I went to HAB at the time, and, and there were six other guys that retired the same year I did. And we all decided that, that we were through manipulating people for a while. We're just going to roll up our sleeves and get some, some physical activity going. So uh, we were the first people to do Habit Jacks on Wednesdays. And we had a little group called the Wednesday Gang who would meet every morning and, and go to us job site and work for Habit Jacks. I did that for 18 years. And I really enjoyed it. I had a place in the mountains and, and it helped me learn how to take care of it because everybody up there is going deer hunting when it's time to work on your, your building. And uh, anyway, it allowed me to buy some tools and learn how to do a couple of things. And, and then we had a group at Hammerjacks called the Order of the Blue Thumb. And when you get a blue thumb, you sometimes speak in tongues. <laughs> and my children learned that when I erected my first tool shed in Mississippi. Uh, the wind was blowing and I didn't even have an electric a cordless drill. But at any rate, we, our wisdom comes from above and is obvious to those who have it. Now, I don't want to insult your intelligence by reading to you, but I think a couple of verses out of Proverbs would be appropriate at this time. Wisdom has builded her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has killed her beasts. 
she hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth maidens that uh, craft upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live and go into the way of understanding. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a man and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man and he'll yet be wiser. Teach a just man and he'll increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So, if you're seeking wisdom, if you're trying to gain, you know, knowledge is great, but knowledge is, well, you know, in the hands of the millennial, knowledge is almost dangerous. <laughs> and I, 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 I say that lightly, but it's almost true because my children have a, uh, you know, a different, and they're 50 years old, but they have a different opinion of, you know, the history of this country. And I'm not going to get into that because I was educated by some people, although my oldest son is also an alumni of that great institution of higher learning in Athens. But uh, that's all right. Wisdom invites us to her house. Her meal is prepared. She's ready to give a party to change your life. The opposite is folly. Folly is another woman, as we we're told, who is loud, obnoxious, <laughs> and uh, not well thought of. And we don't know anybody like that. Do we? Yeah, we do. I do. At any rate, uh, I, and I tell her it once, it's not my wife. <laughs> On the other hand, the wise person will appreciate correction. That means husbands. <laughs> you know, I, got, I, I got into one of Dale's Wednesday night classes at the insistence of my wife who reads my email and knows more about what's going on in the Southside Methodist than I do. And she got me to enroll in one of Dale's Wednesday night classes about how to be nice to your wife. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and there's nine of us. And I'm, me and another guy, uh, Bob Erdese, are about the oldest. And the other seven, three of them have been divorced already. <laughs> and boy, they, they had that down. They said a happy wife's a happy life. And you know all that stuff they tell you. And uh, I, I think, I think you know, as far as wisdom goes with, with a, a married couple, they're a couple. They're a partnership. They take care of each other willingly. They do what's right willingly. Now, I do have to be reminded to do a few things around the house that I, I don't not do them. I just don't, I mean, I don't intend to not do them. I just don't do them. But that's okay. I, I really think that that um, it's because I love my wife that I do these things and not because some Bible teacher told me to, to be a good Christian. I'm a Christian. I don't know how good I am. Sometimes I'm not, not as good as I would like to be, but most of the time I get by without getting yelled. It's just like my youngest son was a gifted athlete. But when we moved from Hattiesburg, Mississippi to Jacksonville, Florida, I was talking to his football coach, I mean his basketball coach, and uh, I said, you're not yelling at Alex. Alex thinks if you don't yell at him, you don't like him. 
So he got yelled at and did work pretty well after that. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, everybody has a different button to get pushed. Uh, I don't herd well. Somebody yells at me, they're, they're going the wrong way. Because uh, I will not respond affirmatively to that. But most people don't. But genuine wisdom is characterized by humility and a teachable spirit. That coincides with being smart, doesn't it? You know, wisdom is really another word for being smart with the knowledge that you have. Now, anybody in today's civilization that can't get a hold of knowledge is crazy. I mean, you, the Internet's got more knowledge than we can all absorb, you know, like make 15 minutes long. But we have the knowledge of the ages at our fingertips. We can find out, I, I found out it was something I didn't know. Remember Ur, I mean, yeah, remember Ur of the Chaldeans where Abraham, where Abram came from? Well, that was actually from Sumer, the Sumerian civilization produced the Chaldeans who produced Ur. I didn't know that. That's, that's one of the things that makes me willing to teach classes once in a while is I have to study a little bit more to learn what to tell people. And I learn a couple of things once in a while. Not all the time, but at, at any rate, we, we characterize folly, the woman who is referred to as folly in between her and wisdom, and she is described as Clamorous, noisy, loud, and obnoxious. He's a data girl, just like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's seen the other for a better looking guy. But I see her once in a while. Folly says in her enticement to people passing by her house stolen waters are sweeter. A bread eaten in secret is pleasant. People that do that don't understand that the room they're eating all that stuff in is full of dead people. That's right. Because Satan is pretty smart. He dresses Folly up where well, she looks pretty good. And sometimes um, I have to recognize who that is to know that. You know, uh, I, uh, I didn't get married until I was 30 years old. And one of the blessings of that is that I got all that wild stuff out of my system. <laughs> And uh, when, I, when I met my wife, she was teaching school in Fort Lauderdale, and we got, we got, him, uh, we got engaged, and my mother was still alive at the time, living in Atlanta, and I was living in Fort Lauderdale at the time. And I told her, I told my mother about that. She said, well, what's her name? I said, Marilyn Bombach. She said, oh my goodness, she went to Miami and found a nice little Jewish girl. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not. But uh, we, we went to Germany a couple of years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago now, uh, on a mission trip with a Baptist. And, and so Marilyn was going, and she said, I'm going to look up and see if there's a, a bombback castle or city or something like that. And she found one and got online, you know, and got on the webpage. First thing you know, 
they're sending her a lot of email about how much can you contribute to it destroying the camp. <laughs> and all that. So, so we we got over there and, and we had a rental car for three days before we reported. And I took a picture of her next to Bombach Germany. Well, right right before we moved to Jacksonville from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, I took her over to Natchez, which is probably got more antebellum homes that are just beautiful. And I took her to about the biggest one called the Burn. And I took a picture standing down in the front yard. And when we came here, we told somebody, that's the old homestead we came from. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the Burn looks good. But uh, folks in Mississippi are suffering a little bit right now because they've been picked on for years and years and years. And in Mississippi, they say, thank God for Arkansas. <laughs> but um, you know, when we lived in Mississippi, we had we had a, a, a black guy married to a white woman on the front house, first house you encounter when you go into our. I called it dead end street. It was a cul-de-sac, and everybody loved him. He had a, some convertibles that he you know, kept in good shape, and he'd drive the homecoming queen down the road and all that stuff. But his son and my son were very close. What I'm saying to you is that uh, the people in Mississippi have better race relations than they do in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Or Milwaukee. <laughs> Not Milwaukee, was it? Minneapolis. Yeah. And that's probably because they've been living together for a little bit longer. Now, my wife was born and raised in the suburb of Chicago. And our company headquarters is in Chicago. And she used to tell me whenever I'd leave to go to work that I didn't do well, but now it's so good you get promoted to Chicago. And I turned down three, you know, uh, promotions to not go to Chicago. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, of all the big cities I've ever been to, that's a friend of nicest one of them but the you know the weather's too bad but the good people up there it's like my oldest son was uh, raised as a baptist and he uh, I, I told both my sons i said it's easy to marry a rich girl as a poor girl <laughs> they went one better they both married girls with really good jobs <laughs> so he married this girl that uh, not only a looker, but smart as a whip, and she does very well. And uh, she was a Catholic. And well, Rich wasn't going to be a Catholic, and she wasn't a, a hardcore practicing Catholic, so they became Lutherans. It's like Episcopalians, that's a Catholic with flunked their Latin. You know. And. Uh, you know, they've been Lutherans all along, and he's kind of like the youth minister at this small Lutheran church down in St. John's. And my other daughter-in-law's got an even better job. She's in charge of all public affairs for the St. John's County School Board. The St. John's County's got the best school system in the country, not far but the country, and the test prove it. Wow. So she's doing well. And my son's a teacher. He, he teaches second grade, and he works for her, I guess. <laughs> but at any rate, they, they were wise enough to take my advice one step further. So we, we tend to do what seems appropriate. We tend to take the easiest way out. And sometimes that gets us in trouble. Did me... I was uh, an all-star in the party league, and at Georgia, Georgia was the partiest school in the South at the time. We were there. And in fact, I saw something in the paper that said that uh, Florida State and now was now the number one or two party school, you know, in the country. And I called up my old roommate who lives in Atlanta, still does. 
I said, Jack, I said, we've, we've lost. In fact, we didn't even get mentioned, Jack, that that's for amateurs. <laughs> Georgia's still a good place. It's a good place to party and it's a good place to learn. And um, I'm glad I went there. I'm a proud son of the sound. I, 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 to my knowledge, I have never mistreated a black person you know, on purpose or indirectly that I know of. And I really feel for, you know, black folks and what they're going through. And I knew there was a lot of bad stuff going on. I was raised by a black woman. Both my parents worked and we had a maid coming. And she took me in hand and raised me. I mean, we all lived in the same house. But when that woman died, I cried and went to her funeral. It was hard and carried on. And my brother was a doctor at Emory Hospital, you know, at Henry Gregg Hospital in Atlanta. When we took Rachel down there, they put her in a horrible place. And my mother went to my brother, half brother, and told him about it, and he got her out. She was in a more than adequate room, and this and that. But we had, kind of like people in Mississippi, we had black people we loved. And uh, I, I think a lot of black people loved us, but now we don't know what to say, what to do. I pray every night for wisdom so I'll know how to understand what's going on now. Because I don't think all these people that are, you know, looting and burning and carrying on are doing that because they've been mistreated. I think they're doing that because they're crazy. <laughs> they're foolish. You know, they've been sold a bill of goods. But I need to understand how to treat them so that they'll turn around and become productive citizens. Well, I'll be a whole lot better off if they're productive citizens. It's kind of like habitats. I remember when we moved in, I forget who the mayor was, oh, God, though. But then Ed Austin took over, and that was about the time the tax laws changed. And uh, somebody from Haberjacks went to see Ed Austin and told him, you know, what a beautiful thing this could be. So Haberjacks, with Ed Austin's help, got all the city property that had been confiscated for taxes and gave it to us, and we sold it to the new homeowners at bargain distressed prices that they could afford. And I remember we built 600 houses up in the Northeast in two years. You know what that did for the government economy? All that land is paying taxes. Yeah. All those kids are home in the afternoon and at night instead of in jail. The slum lords hated us. And it kept going on and on and on. And I remember the third year I was there, I stand up on a rooftop and I looked around that neighborhood and I could see about 40 homes. Every one of them looked better than the day that the owner moved in. And I said, man, this works. Now, to my knowledge, 99% of the houses that we built were sold to bank people. It wasn't a handout. They had to work to get it. You know, sweat equity, pay for it. This and another, but <coughs> Haberjack was run by kind of a bunch of incompetents and one of them in the church, man. But the idea is so good that it works in spite of itself instead of because of itself. And that the one thing that they do is they screen the applicants and get people that sincerely want to better their lives. And 
we, we figured out it's better to put them to what we, we when we got a building, a piece of property, we, we made them come to class, learn how to fix the washing machine, how to do books, how to pay checks, you know, that kind of stuff. Because they, they really, you know, it's like they kept saying, well, we're driving these donated Chinese nails that keep bending when we hit them. And that really wasn't the case. They just didn't have those skills. But they had the, the skills to learn. They weren't done. And they learned how to take care of their property. And I think that was wise. I think we need to be wise in what we do. And I, I sincerely hope that we will pray so that we will know what to do the next time some, you know, whether it's a black person or anybody else needs our help, what can we do? Do we want to enable a drunk? No. Do we want to take care of a drunk? Yeah. <coughs> We want to get them going on the right direction, but that's hard to do when you're preaching at them, you know? I don't hurt well. Uh, people don't uh, offer me advice that I pay attention to, and that's to my detriment sometimes, but I've survived. But I know that God's going to take care of me no matter I guess no matter how bad I act, I act pretty bad sometimes, but I'm pretty much straight now. I quit smoking, quit drinking, quit gambling, quit drinking. There ain't much I can do anymore. But I'm still having fun. Uh, and I don't know how, you know? I mean, I don't know what it is I'm doing every day. But at any rate, I think we can safely conclude that the thing we need more than anything else is business. Go and say no more. Amen. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that uh, wisdom was one of the major topics here. Uh, these are some suggestions for us who are seniors. The first one is talk to yourself. There are times when you need expert advice. <laughs> In style, of course, you know, those are clothes that still fit. You don't need anger management. You need people to stop making you mad. <laughs> your people skills are just fine. It's just your tolerance for idiots that needs work. <laughs> the biggest lie you tell yourself is, I don't need to write that down. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> On time is when you get there. Even duct tape can't fix stupid, <laughs> but it sure does muffle the sound. <laughs> it would be wonderful if we could put ourselves in the dryer for 10 minutes and come out wrinkle free. Whoa, no. <laughs> and three sizes smaller. <laughs> you know, as you look around at people your age, they're so much older than you are. <laughs> and I know that growing old should have taken a lot longer than it has. <laughs> Aging has slowed you down but hasn't shut us up. If you still haven't learned to act your age, and hope you never will. And one more, one for the road means going to the bathroom before you leave the house. <laughs> it will all be dismissed. Let the words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Richard. Let me give this to you. I need it.
Yeah.